Art makes me me. My doctor prescribed Tigrisso. Ask your doctor if Tigrisso is right for you. Hi, we're going to wait a minute as uh, people join and then we'll get started. All right, let's get started. Hello and welcome to the special edition of the Outcomes for Me Ask the Expert webinar series. Today, we're privileged to connect you with a leading expert in lung cancer who's here to address your questions and share insights direct, drawn directly from our community. Thank you for being part of this important conversation. For those of you who may, may be joining for the first time, my name is Neil Margolis and I lead the development of clinical content and treatment algorithms at Outcomes for Me. Our platform, driven by the latest AI technology, is dedicated to empowering cancer patients by providing them with personalized evidence-based treatment options and vital information. Working alongside a dynamic team, I'm committed to democratizing healthcare, ensuring that every patient has access to tailored information about their diagnosis, treatment options, testing recommendations, and the latest in clinical trials, news, and education. Outcomes for me exist because we believe in equipping patients with the tools they need to actively engage in their care with a full understanding of their options and the newest research in, in cancer treatment. For today's webinar, we're honored to welcome Dr. Martin F. Dietrich, a distinguished medical oncologist and researcher specializing in lung cancer treatment. Dr. Dietrich will share insights on cutting edge advancements in lung cancer care and guide us through essential questions patients should ask their medical team post-diagnosis to ensure optimal treatment. Dr. Dietrich is a medical oncologist at US Oncology and assistant professor of internal medicine at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. A molecular geneticist by training, he has a special clinical and research interest in targeted therapy approaches and development of new investigational agents. His practice focuses on thoracic and breast malignancies, and he's an investigator on numerous precision medicine-based trials. He's actively involved in training the next generation of oncology physician scientists at the University of Central Florida. Welcome, Dr. Dietrich. Could you please start off by introducing yourself and sharing anything I might have missed with our community? No, that's exactly right. Thank you so much, Neil, for having me today. My um, uh, my background is uh, is well summarized. I um, did train as a geneticist first. And um, this was in a time uh, 20, 25 years ago where um, genetics became understandable. We had the blueprint in um, the Human Genome Project, how a normal genetic setup is, is going to look like. And then we were able to compare it to the genetics of cancer. And that's how my, my interest in, in oncology unfolded. And um, till today, very exciting uh, developments that we have seen. And many of them are based on the insight we have uh, learn from comparing the normal genetic blueprint to what uh, changes we are identifying in cancer. So it's still exciting and um, still um, a passion that uh, drives me every, uh, to work every day. Yeah, I mean, it's a very exciting time, not just for cancer in general, but for lung cancer specifically, I think. Uh, I've certainly seen a lot of changes uh, due to molecular markers over the past 10 to 15 years. Oh, so uh, we have a number of questions. Uh, that have been submitted by our community, and we're going to get to them. And I'd like to start off by talking about lung cancer diagnosis and testing. Uh, so a patient has gotten their a diagnosis. Um, how, how do you or how do doctors uh, determine the type and stage of lung cancer that a patient has? So that's a very important, uh, important part. And I think there are two separate questions. One is what type of lung cancer is, and that requires um, a biopsy uh, to see how the cancer looks like under the microscope or histology. Um, that's a um, broad uh, spectrum where we have non-small cell and small cell lung cancer and then different subsets of non-small cell lung cancer. And then a second layer, um, and that's what we're going to be talking about a lot today, of molecular features, of genetic changes that we're trying to understand, in addition to some markers that help us identify patients that would benefit particular uh, 
the benefit from from immunotherapies. So that's the uh, that's the, the what part and how far has it gone? Well, there are two ways of uh, of, of looking at this. We would first start uh, with scans of the entire body. I think that's pretty much standard for for all lung cancer diagnosis with a PET scan in the beginning to look at um, the entire body, looking at anatomic changes of of disease suspicion, and then also looking at metabolic activity. Cancer consumes a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. And so with a, a, a PET scan, we're able to see these hotspots of energy consumption and correlate them with changes that we're concerned about for cancer spread. And then a little bit challenging in the brain. And you can imagine the brain has a lot of background activity. And so if we would use a PET scan for the brain, we would see activity in the background of activity, and we would be able to unfortunately, to miss things. So we need to complement the PET scans with an MRI of the brain to get the full body staging. And that gives us uh, the, disease, the extent of disease spread and typically a, um, a stage of the diagnosis, which goes from stage one, which is a localized tumor, to stage four, which is a tumor that has spread to other parts of the body and uh, sort of gray um, um, shades in between for local um, size and lymph node involvement that would uh, constitute stage two and stage three. Okay. And uh, I'm sure a very common question these days is, uh, should all non-small cell lung cancer patients undergo comprehensive biomarker testing? And uh, if not, why not? So the answer is absolutely yes. And if it hasn't been done, um, well, that is a, that's a major missing piece of information. And um, we learned most of what we know about lung cancer genetics in stage four. Um, but what we realize now is that biology uh, is not stage dependent. So what the things that we've learned in stage four um, translate very well to stage three and stage two and stage one. Every time we need systemic therapy, um, these genetic markers guide us uh, to the optimal treatment. So yes, absolutely, this needs to be done as top priority um, in uh, selecting treatments for a stage two patient as well as it is for a stage four patient. So unanimously um, deserve um, genetic testing on a comprehensive basis, really looking for the entire um, array of abnormalities that can be seen on the genetic level. Okay. And uh, how soon can biomarker testing uh, be performed after the diagnosis? So um, well, this is a little bit of a paradigm shift. Um, in uh, in my practice, I, I can look at CT scans and oftentimes really have a pretty good idea of whether or not we're looking at a lung cancer or not, just based on the CT scan, even if the biopsy hasn't been done before. So I oftentimes initiate what we call a liquid biopsy, which is a, um, um, a collection of, of tumor DNA extracted from the, uh, from the blood or from the plasma of the blood um, and trying to get this started as soon as possible. We've published this. Um, the sooner we have the information, the sooner we can get a patient to treatment, the sooner we can, um, we can uh, tackle the cancer. Um, I would do it as fast as possible when the biopsy is obtained also on tissue. Um, but obviously getting a biopsy does require um, typically um, another set of schedule um, uh, um, steps that we need to take uh, into account and then ordering molecular testing on it and can take quite, uh, up to two, up to two to three weeks to actually get all of those information pieces together. Those delays uh, we can shorten by integrating liquid biopsy at the same time. So uh, the earlier the better, um, trying to work towards an improved uh, turnaround time and availability of this information really uh, the rate limiting step oftentimes in making a proper treatment recommendation. The diagnosis is simply not complete without genetics. Hmm. Okay. And and you mentioned uh, tissue biopsies and liquid biopsies. Could you talk a little bit about the differences, the pros and cons of each? Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the liquid biopsy is a simple blood draw, essentially. We're looking at, um, an, um, looking at uh, tumor DNA that has been shed into the bloodstream um, and we're able to capture this tumor DNA and process it from the bloodstream as well. Obviously, the benefits is it's readily available. It's very easy to do. It's really not any different than any other blood draw. So it's a very quick um, situation for us. And typically, the turnaround time is around seven days for us um, when we're when we're getting it in clinic. So very very efficient uh, uh, technology. It takes five to six days to run the test, uh, one day to submit it to a reference laboratory. So the seven days is um, about as fast as we're gonna be able to have it. Uh, the tissue biopsy um, obviously gives us a, um, a little bit more information. We have more DNA material. You can imagine how dilute um, DNA in the, in the circulating bloodstream is. There's a lot of background DNA um, that uh, comes from the, from the healthy cells of the body. 
Um, when you biopsy a tumor, you have a much more concentrated form of, of, of DNA. You have more DNA as well, so you can run a more um, broad profile. You can look at different layers of, of genetic material, not only DNA, but RNA. I don't want to be confusing with the details, but it allows us to maximize the sensitivity of the test and also allows us to do some additional functional stains like PDL1, which is a major marker for immunotherapy uh, efficiency. So it's not liquid against tissue, they belong together. And I'm, I'm very certain uh, in um, two to three years from now, this is the only way how we're gonna do it. And then we always will we'll wonder why haven't we done this sooner? They complement each other very, very well in both practical and scientific manners. All right. Um, if there isn't enough tissue uh, available for testing, what are, what are patients' options? Well, um, again, sometimes we get the information we need, um, especially um, in, in symptomatic patient already from the bloodstream. A symptomatic patient typically has more tumor, and, and um, uh, more tumor means more tumor DNA in the bloodstream. The sensitivity of the liquid biopsy gets better. So oftentimes we get a histological diagnosis like an adenocarcinoma, but not enough tissue for a... Um, a comprehensive molecular profile from the tissue, but we can complement it with the information we get from the liquid biopsy. Um, if a patient um, is uh, not symptomatic um, or uh, has very limited uh, symptoms, oftentimes we recommend a, a re-biopsy. Uh, but in my experience, I think that's shared by many of our colleagues that we are um, seeing incredibly strong sensitivity with the new NGS-based assays from the blood, so that in 80% of cases or so, will be able to make a, a genetic classification of the tumor based on the liquid biopsy alone. And they still go together, um, but oftentimes we're able to synthesize the information we have relatively quickly with the integration of the liquid biopsy. Okay, and uh, do you ever have to start uh, treatment before you have those molecular results? And when that happens, how does that play out for the patient? Yeah, so we, I don't see this much for non-small cell lung cancer. Um, we do have um, sort of empiric treatments for small cell lung cancer uh, where the genetics are not quite as well understood. And um, small cell, even more so of a medical emergency where patients need to get treated. I really, really try to avoid it. And I haven't had it in a long time, um, largely attributed to the availability of, of liquid biopsy. Um, this really um, becomes less of an issue that we really pushed um, we always have the discussion with our patients. Well, why are you not more proactive? Why are we not um, getting involved in, in, in treatment? And um, the simple answer is um, that we really want to give every patient the best and most fitting and most effective treatment. And that requires having all the information pieces on the table. So um, patients for an additional week uh, can pay off um, 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 in, in big ways later on um, when, we, um, when we treat a patient with the appropriate therapy. Um, you, you want to get to treatment fast, and we really try to avoid any unnecessary delays. We really try to get patients into, into a clinic within 48 hours and initiate our, our um, workup steps um, very promptly. And, but I still would uh, encourage to uh, reserve the unavailability of genetic um, um, information in the context of decision-making. Um, this really is... Um, sort of reserved for the absolute exception in, in 2024. Um, liquid biopsy is so fast, um, it, it should be available. And especially in symptomatic patients, liquid biopsy sensitivity is excellent. Okay. And is it ever necessary to repeat biomarker testing, whether immediately or during treatment? So um, uh, yeah, upfront, obviously, as you mentioned, the re-biopsy um, can, be, can be required. Sometimes if there's uh, very little tumor shed, if there's an, an earlier stage, the liquid biopsy may not be as sensitive. Um, in terms of genetic evolution, um, I think that's very important once we start treating a, a cancer. Similar like when we treat a bacteria on four with antibiotics, uh, genetic adaptation or genetic evolution happens. So the initial um, genetic setup that we're seeing is not the same that we're seeing when a patient has been treated. So at um, every turn of the um, of, of, of events, every time a tumor starts acting differently, um, there has to be an explanation. Sometimes we don't find the explanation, but we always try to. Uh, so testing and retesting is very, very important. We have many patients now um, with EGFR, lung cancer, for example, that have been tested three or four times as they go through the different lines of therapy. And it's very important to not 
make the first uh, sort of decision making informed, and then the second and third turn of decision making uninformed, we really have to understand what kind of cancer are we looking at at every time at every turn of events. Um, in particular, as we're moving out further, clinical trial options and um, more uh, nuanced decisions are um, are coming into play. So strongly recommend to stay on top of biopsies, uh, liquid and tissue, um, when the clinical behavior of a cancer uh, um, changes and worsens. All right. So we'll move on to a little bit about treatment planning, treatment options. And I'm about to ask you a big question that you can probably talk about for the rest of for the rest of our webinar, but we'll try to figure out how to make our way through it. How are the re results of the biomarker testing? Um, how do they influence the treatment options a patient will have? Well, in, in all honesty, they are the, the major factor in, in, in decision making treatment. If a patient has an EGFR mutation in the bloodstream, I almost don't uh, need to know what the histology is. I would give them a targeted therapy. Um, in the in the first line setting as the best recommendation. Um, if a patient doesn't have biomarkers, um, that's not necessarily a negative result. Um, it's just a result that informs a patient would probably be best served with an immunotherapy-based approach. And there are, there's not necessarily only one genetic factor that is that is playing a role, but it's a very complex um, subgroup of, um, of, of the cancers. If you think about lung cancer, it's a family of diseases genetically defined. And uh, it's getting very complex. And for each of these subtypes, we oftentimes have multiple options. We have five ALK inhibitors. We have um, at least five EGFR inhibitors <clears throat> that are that are currently approved plus combinations. So really understanding not just the, the big picture, but really the nuances and the details are, are very important. And oftentimes it's helpful when we have a patient with a, um, a mutation that may not even have been reported before, but sort of falls in the same family that we uh, invoke additional help from molecular geneticists, uh, from molecular pathologists, or even um, second opinion experts that are um, focusing on the, on, on, on the subtype of mutations that we're looking at. So that's very, very important. Uh, the complexity um, in, in genetics is incredibly, incredibly high. We're trying to collect as much of, uh, of these information pieces. There are big databases that are looking at them, but sometimes we have seen a mutation once or twice and have not more information than one or two patients treated. Um, but they really define you know, the three-dimensional construct of, of genetics really defines uh, the treatment steps for patients. And what are the most common uh, biomarkers that you see with your, mm -hmm. uh, with your patients? Well, um, the, a, a very large part is patients that we do not identify what we call a driver mutation, a central genetic um, um, switch um, that we can understand. Uh, but of those that we understand, um, those are all complex names, and it's sort of its own challenge to pronounce them right. KRAS is 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 the most common one, and it's also a family of of uh, genetic alterations in in KRAS. We have uh, for the KRAS G12C subtype, we have two drugs approved in the clinic. Um, KRAS also responds very well to immunotherapy, and the second most common family is EGFR. EGFR also a very diverse family of of, of mutations that require very refined and nuanced treatment approaches. ALK. Uh, we just had some beautiful data at um, at uh, at ASCO this year, uh, putting ALK on the map for really very very excellent long term survival. Uh, but there are about uh, about a dozen mutations that have FDA approved uh, therapies correlated, and some but we don't have an FDA um, approved label, but we know that they work uh, quite well in other tumors, and oftentimes uh, borrow those medications from other tumor types to help our patients with lung cancer. So incredibly complex. It's really I have, I've been doing this for twenty plus years since my early PhD days, and I still learn every day about uh, uh, about how incredibly um, gray shaded um, lung cancer is. And how about uh, immunotherapy? You mentioned uh, PDL one not too long ago. Uh, how is that identified, and what are a patient's options, and maybe even when uh, and what stages uh, that can come into play? Right. Um, again, as I mentioned, the therapies that we've had in stage four have really uh, largely moved into um, into earlier stages, including immunotherapy. Um, so immunotherapy has a, a big impact in, in in early stage disease as well. Um, what we are, the first part is always the genetics. Uh, so that's very important. PDL one without genetics um, means very little. Um, PDL one is an is an activity marker of um, 
the communication pathway between a tumor cell and an immune cell. And the more active it is, the more likely it's implicated in the tumor cells attempt to evade um, being detected and being um, destroyed by the immune system's effort. If you think about cancer, uh, one of the hallmarks is that the immune system uh, didn't recognize um, a, tra a cancerous transformation. And we, we form abnormal cells all day, every day. And what happens normally is that the immune system eliminates them. So if we understand, and PDL1 is really the one that we understand best, how the immune system escapes, um, it really gives us a very, very good option. We have nine of these PD1, PDL1 inhibitors approved in, uh, in cancer, and we have five of them in lung cancer. And, and more coming. Um, and we have seen, and um, you and I were at the, uh, the World uh, Conference for Lung Cancer together, we've seen the next generation of, uh, of therapies. They're still sort of based around a PD-1, um, but they're really going much further now and really having more durable responses. But the idea is to treat the immune system again, to recognize cancer and induce responses that are driven by a memory response of the immune system. It's a very fascinating um, sort of immune activating mechanism that uh, that can um, induce very durable remissions in lung cancer. Very much a, a hopeful hopeful strategy, but genetics plus pdl one is the way of determining if a patient is a good candidate for, for immunotherapy. Okay. Well, we've, we're starting to get some uh, questions from our live community chat, uh, and I encourage people to uh, post there. Uh, one of them is, what are the issues and treatments when adenocarcinoma is in the pleura? Well, uh, th there are multiple issues. Yes, the pleura is the, the membrane that lines the, the lung, but also uh, lines the inner um, surface of the chest cavity. So the lung is sort of uh, a, a, a sack of air that sits in a, in a, in a cavity. If the, the pleura is involved in an early stage, um, it is concerning because the pleura has lymphatic um, vessels that are um, a, a high risk concern for early spread. If it is in a, in a more locally advanced setting, the tumor may not be resectable. The tumor may be um, invading into the, into the nerve cells, may be more painful. Um, and oftentimes um, those are more challenging uh, to, uh, to treat local, um, local tumors uh, when we're seeing them. They can um, uh, be uh, considered high risk again in the early stage and oftentimes more symptomatic in the advanced stage. And we use a lot of radiation for local treatment. They can grow through the pleura into ribs or um, uh, the pleura itself, and everybody has heard about uh, pleuritis, and um, um, this is a very, very painful condition because the lung itself, as you know, and that's why lung doesn't have early warning signs, doesn't have any, um, doesn't have any um, uh, uh, early warning signs. It doesn't hurt to have lung cancer in early stages, but once it reaches the pleura, you can actually feel it, and you can feel it quite significant. All right. Um... So another question that came in, you had mentioned uh, ASCO results. What are the new drugs mentioned at ASCO for KRAS G12C? Well, you know, we have a, a, a whole slew of new drugs for, for KRAS in, uh, in, in, in general and for uh, G12C in particular. We have two drugs, uh, Sotorosib and Adagosib, that have been approved for KRAS G12C. Um, those are um, the first generation of drugs we have seen very good results for a drug called Devarasib, um, which is very similar. But I think where we're going is into a direction where um, KRAS um, inhibitors are trapping um, KRAS in a state where it's not mutation specific. And um, so we have drugs that don't even have really a graspable name yet. We've started a trial with RMC6326. It's a uh, revolution medicine drug that has uh, capability to extend into all subtypes of, of, of KRAS. And there are many concepts that flank um, uh, KRAS that uh, um, we are trying to target. Because again, KRAS by far the most common genetic alteration in cancer and also in lung cancer. And so a, um, a very, very dynamic field uh, to give us opportunity. And again, as I mentioned, um, KRAS signifies a biology that is very responsive to immunotherapy. So we are able to give um, these target therapies with immunotherapies. Oftentimes they're mutually exclusive in EGFR. Immunotherapy has very little or no impact. So we don't ever give immunotherapy here. And um, this looks, um, this looks um, as a dual purpose and maybe even a replacement for, um, for chemotherapy in the KRAS phase. Okay, switching gears again, uh, we did get a question about um, how you decide about the recommended treatment goal. 
um, for example, a palliative goal versus a curative goal? So one of the things that I've I've acquired over the years is is unrelenting optimism. I've seen um, I've seen things changing from a point where lung cancer treatment was a um, very very unsatisfying, short lived, and oftentimes very difficult to tolerate treatment into situations where I think of uh, of many of of the lung cancers at least potentially um, survivable. Uh, so I want to be um, I want to be very clear that it's um, uh, very difficult to have a, a sort of a curative versus palliative kind of black and white kind of situation. We have, and if you treat enough lung cancer, you will see long-term survivors on immunotherapy um, that are uh, off treatment and have been cancer-free for a long time. So that's a um, a, a word of encouragement. Um, but in the end, um, it really depends on um, on 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 the patient's goals. I mean, uh, and, and the patient's preferences for. Um, for treatment, my job is to is to understand um, and the biology and translate it into into reasonable and, and evidence based um, uh, treatment options from which we can pick, um, and then we can relate to the uh, to our patients uh, what those what those realistic expectations would be. Um, again, I've seen long term um, uh, survivors with with EGFR mutations. I've seen them with immunotherapy. Um, I would not uh, uh, like to listen to um, uh, many of my colleagues that uh, only sort of have a general impression of lung cancer. Lung cancer is no longer um, uh, a, a hopeless disease that shouldn't even be biopsied. We see this still a lot in the community that patients were told, well, you have lung cancer, uh, probably not reasonable to, um, to, to do anything about it. This is not gonna be, uh, not gonna be good. And uh, we've seen um, some very remarkable outcomes. So my, my encouragement is, um, uh, the only way to advise a patient is after molecular testing has been completed to lay out a realistic set of options for, for patients. And some patients say, I want to get treated, but I don't want chemotherapy. And the truth is we can make this happen for uh, for the vast majority of patients um, that they get immunotherapy. We have a practice in Florida have patients well into their 90s and they're doing, they're doing uh, quite well with immunotherapy and targeted therapies. So um, the idea of, uh, of, of lung cancer being um, and, and, and impossible conquest. Um, I don't think that's true anymore. And I'm, I'm very glad about this, that we have these options for patients. All right. We've got a couple more questions from our community. And maybe this one, uh, we can turn into a broader one, which is uh, uh, one of our um, viewers asked, what's the treatment for EGFR L861Q exon 21? Uh, and maybe you can talk a little bit about the different types of EGFR uh, mutations that uh, we've classified at this point. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very, very good question. So we have a, um, um, a family of mutations um, that uh, we classify by um, by different exons. A, a, a protein is 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 sort of a um, patchwork of different what we call exons uh, on the DNA strand. An exon is a part of the codes for a part of the protein. Um, and we basically assemble those into one linear uh, strand of, of amino acids that we call the protein, like an EGFR protein. And um, in exon 18, 19, 20, and 21 is where we see um, uh, genetic changes that can transform um, a, a lung cancer cell, a lung cell into a lung cancer cell. Um, there are many nuances to this, and you are uh, you're describing. Um, the L861Q mutation is an, is an exon 21 uh, point mutation that um, increases um, activity of the EGFR receptor by enhancing the affinity to its favorite fuel. Um, and um, the treatment there um, uh, would be a targeted therapy. I think we have seen some very good results with our traditional standard um, called osimertinib or tagrisol. Um, I think this was the uh, the the, the, the sort of the gold standard since 2017, um, when we've seen the first clinical trial result. But more more recently, we've actually seen additional um, um, combinations. Uh, we've seen um, uh, osimertinib plus chemotherapy, mm -hmm. and we've also seen an, uh, a new drug um, that has um, uh, that's called lacertinib um, uh, with a, a second antibody called amivantamab that sort of tackles the EGFR. Um, protein from from two ends um, that have actually been shown to uh, induce um, some more durable um, uh, mm -hmm. effects. They're obviously more involved. They have um, 
the pill only option that we've had before was very convenient and um, the quality of life on these drugs are very, very good specificity, specificity is excellent. Um, it's um, the reason why L861Q um, may be a little bit confusing because it's not in the, uh, what we would call the traditional or classical EGFR mutation family, but they're so closely related genetically and that for practical purposes, they would be treated like the classical exon 21 alteration L858R, and all the options are, are available. And I've had very good success um, arguing that case um, with, our, with our insurance companies and payers. Um, and uh, I would not make any, uh, any major deviations from those treatment options that are available. It's so closely uh, connected and related, um, and the responses in that subtype are actually very good. Okay. Um, anything about Exxon 20? I know there was a drug out there that was uh, unfortunately pulled from uh, pulled yeah. from the market, but another, at least one more, if not two more drugs have come to take it its place. Yes. So um, um, if you if you think about um, um, what um, the, these L, uh, these EGFR mutations do, they basically shift the um, the uh, conformation of the of the protein. And enhance the binding of, uh, of 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 ATP as its favorite fuel. Um, and um, for exon twenty, the problem is that not only does it enhance the binding of ATP and the activity enhances the downstream activity of the EGFR molecule that leads to cancerous transformation, but it also makes the binding of these new drugs incredibly difficult. Which is why the exon twenty subgroup has always been our our most worrisome subgroup. They share a lot of biological similarities. We see them in younger patients and oftentimes in patients that have smoked very little or not at all. So they share similarities, but because of, uh, of reasons related to drug binding, has been very, very challenging. And you mentioned mobocertinib. Um, mm -hmm. And mobocertinib had a conditional approval for exon 20 mutations um, that was binding the intracellular kinase domain pocket. This was pulled from the market. The confirmatory study was negative, unfortunately. Um, but we do have um, both in single agent and in combination with chemotherapy amivantamab, the antibody that I uh, described uh, in combination with glosertinib for the exon 21 mutations is approved with chemotherapy for, um, uh, for exon, exon 20 mutations as well. And there it has a very, um, a very broad capture. It binds the opposite end of the EGFR molecule. So it, it sort of bypasses the, um, the area that has been Sort of difficult to tackle by simply switching the approach to the molecule, and we've seen some very good responses. And certainly, the, the first line standard in um, in our in our if you detect an EGFR exon twenty mutations to, uh, today, the Papillon study, which is chemotherapy plus amivantamab, is really our our gold standard. I mean, we really try to get um, all in, but that's where the complexity comes. You have to not only understand do I have an EGFR, yes or no, um, but what kind of EGFR do I have? What is the subtype? How do I treat it? Um, how do I manage a drug that has uh, uh, usefulness in, in, in EGFR mutation? So it's quite a quite a complex discussion um, for um, the, the visits where we have the results available. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, and, and I'm going to add that, uh, you know, for our patients listening, I know there's a lot of good patient advocacy groups that are tied into um, pretty much each of these different molecular variations that uh, are drivers for for uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And you might want to Google those. There's an, there is an Exxon 20 group, KRAS group, out plus positive group. Uh, uh, many who, uh, many of those advocates I met at the World Conference uh, of Lung Cancer last week. Um, got a question about treatment uh, for a patient who's had uh, success with immunotherapy, but unfortunately relapsed after a year. What are their options? So um, if a patient has um, an immunotherapy responsive um, responsive cancer for a year, um, and then we see when we see progression afterwards, um, that's obviously a, um, a, a very critical, uh, very critical moment. Um, oftentimes uh, we then use standard of, of, of care options. Um, it could either be genetically defined, so let's say a patient has a KRAS mutation um, and has progressed on an immunotherapy, then we could consider a, a KRAS targeted therapy. I think there are options of chemotherapy, either a second line chemotherapy, or if not given in the first line, uh, also the, um, what we call a platinum doublet. 
Um, but my strong recommendation, I think that's very, very important um, as, a, as a take home message, is we are seeing the advent of the next generation of immunotherapy. So when you're saying you've progressed in immunotherapy, that probably indicates that you were one on one of the drugs um, that have been approved in the market, uh, pembrolizumab, nivolumab, uh, durbalumab, mm -hmm. um, and um, or tezolizumab. I think when, when you see progression on them, I think my next step would be um, a very careful evaluation for these next generation of immunotherapies that are able to uh, induce responses in what we call a PD-1 refractory setting, um, whether it's been sort of an immune tolerance that immunotherapy does not control cancer anymore. Um, and I think there's there's uh, there's still um, a lot of work that needs doing. But these trials really have uh, given us a lot of a lot of hope um, to reinduce an immunotherapy uh, immunotherapy response. But uh, if a PD-1 inhibitor is no longer effective, um, it's either going to be a targeted therapy based on genetic setup or uh, a chemotherapy uh, chemotherapy option for treatment. Okay. And thank you for that. Uh, another question from our viewers. Uh, although not considered standard of care, when would it be appropriate to consider surgery for stage four uh, non-small cell lung cancer? So um, it is actually part of the guidelines in certain circumstances. And I, I want to give you an example. Let's say a patient is uh, receiving an EGFR inhibitor like the patient that I uh, was asking earlier. They have an L858R and L861Q uh, mutation and you're doing well for three years, and then you have a new lesion in um, in one lobe, um, very reasonable to resect that resistant clone um, um, in, in the lung and, and continue the underlying treatment. If this is just one area, uh, I think surgery could be uh, very conceivably be useful, and it's part of the guidelines. Now, if, if you have multiple spots, um, I think surgery may be uh, quite invasive, and we use what we dubbed uh, radio surgery or radiation therapy, and we can uh, treat with uh, oftentimes very good tolerance, multiple spots. We're kind of trying to tease out what a reasonable number of spot is, uh, spots is to treat. Obviously, if you have disseminated um, a new growth in multiple multiple locations, it may be necessary to switch the systemic therapy. Um, but let's say you have two or three new lesions. Um, I think it's very reasonable to use either surgery or radiation to overcome these focal resistances and continue um, a therapy that has been uh, oftentimes been serving a patient for a long time. I think that's a, um, a very reasonable uh, idea. Um, sometimes we do it up front. Let's say a patient has a, a, a lesion in a symptomatic area. Um, so I have a patient, for example, that had a skin metastasis. Um, and the, 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 it's very clear this was a resistant part that didn't respond that well to, to a systemic therapy. We sent mm -hmm. him to the surgeon and had, the, had the, that, that, that area removed. So surgery and radiation as local treatment options, in addition to um, underlying systemic treatment options, play a very big role in, in our considerations upon progression. Okay. Um, another question from our audience. How long is Tegriso effective for? It's a, it's a very long, uh, uh, long <laughs> answer, but I, I, I want to say it is a bell curve, and we know... Um, certain prognostic factors that um, give us an idea how long we think that uh, Tegriso is going to be effective. This never made a difference before because Tegriso was the only reasonable option in treatment. And now that we have combinations, we try to be more uh, granular in defining the prognostic impact of treatment. Um, if I have a patient that has brain metastases, for example, where Tegriso is very effective, but may not be as effective for uh, as long as we would like it to be, this would be a, a patient scenario where I would strongly recommend the consideration of a, of a, of a, of a combination, either uh, an amivantinib lacertinib combination or an osimertinib chemotherapy combination. Um, but we've seen uh, responses that last somewhere from eight um, months to, uh, to, to many, many years. Uh, certainly patients that have 10 plus years of, of uh, responses on Tegriso, and uh, the average or the median of um, of responses is about is about nineteen months, and um, but this is a very very broad spectrum. And so, um, my recommendation would be if an EGFR is diagnosed upfront, and um, really to not only look at EGFR but really at the multiplex of of factors, clinical and molecular features, and to decide whether a combination may be uh, maybe the way to go. Um, I think that's a um, a discussion between you and your you and your physician. 
um, I have a lot of young patients where I, I, I lean very strongly towards the combination and because we really want to maximize the benefit of each line of therapy and the combinations really have uh, proven that they are um, uh, you know, quite effective in the upfront setting. Okay. Uh, we did um, actually, could you repeat the um, new um, treatments that may be available for KRAS for all for all types of KRAS? I should say. Yes. So um, I, I will add that uh, that we will be um, uh, replaying or or making this recording available, so anyone can watch it again and uh, take all the notes that they want. But go ahead. So I, I do want to say there is um, uh, there are multiple agents. I think uh, RMC sixty three twenty six is probably um, uh, this this is the investigational name, but they've had some very nice uh, they have had some very nice data for the non-G12C subgroups, mm -hmm. so RMC uh, 6326. It does work for G12C, but obviously the need there is not quite as high. Um, we've seen um, a, a, um, a compounds that target adjacent molecules um, that are um, that are helpful. I think the um, IMM1104 uh, is an immunearing drug that targets the, the pathway right underneath it, the MAP kinase pathway. Uh, very very nice responses. Um, it's early, and those are those are certainly drugs that are still needing to stand the test of, test of time. Um, but I would strongly consider those options um, if the immunotherapy um, is no longer effective for a patient that has a KRAS mutation in their tumor. Um, these novel agents should be strongly considered because the alternative would be really chemotherapy, and um, for uh, for the most part. So I would uh, I would think. Um, that this would be a very strong recommendation. And in our uh, geography, we're really trying to exchange our clinical trial options to really have the option across the entire KRAS spectrum. And KRAS, like EGFR, is not one mutation. It's not one, one gene, one mutation, but it's an entire family. And some, uh, some, some scientists have dedicated, devoted their entire life to understanding how the individual mutations impact um, the function of the molecule. Um, strongly recommend this, but those are those are the drugs that I think have uh, a very big potential. But it's a very active field, so whatever whatever can be uh, reasonably offered to you and should uh, should be looked at very carefully. And, and is G12C the most common of that family? So in lung cancer, very interesting. Uh, KRAS is a is a gene that's found in all cancers, um, mm -hmm. but in in lung cancer, about half of the KRAS mutations are G12C. Um, now, this is one in eight um, that is G12C and one in eight that's non-G12C. So it's a broad family of, um, of, of, of mutations. And unfortunately, um, many, I mean, this is on the basis of, uh, of about a quarter million cases a year. Um, so you can imagine how large the numbers are on, on both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. And, and for those uh, drugs that target, G, uh, well, KRAS in general, G12C perhaps, in particular, are they also being used or tested in some of the other uh, cancers where KRAS may, may be a driver? So biology transcends histology. Um, so the, the, <laughs> this is a, um, a, a we, we, we borrow drugs um, that are approved in other cancers for lung, uh, test them in clinical trials and vice versa. Um, G12C comes in, in, in many other cancers in pancreas and colon, uh, colon is actually approved now, um, but um, it's enriched in lung cancer. G12C is um, is really um, heavily connected to uh, to the lung subtype, and we don't see it that much in other cancers. Yeah, but they, they the drugs certainly have the same uh, the same interest based on this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so how how do we monitor if treatment is working? Um, how often will scans be done? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, there are. Um, um, a number of new technologies coming, but the standard is uh, is to scan every three months um, the body with a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And if a patient had brain metastases at baseline, I would also scan the brain every three months to ensure that this highly um, highly sensitive um, area is uh, is connected um, um, in um, in um, Sort of the surveillance mechanism. If a patient doesn't have brain metastasis at baseline, we're a little bit less stringent. You know, an MRI is kind of a undertaking, not very pleasant to be in this machine for a long time. So we probably do it more every six months or so. Um, 
um, or if a patient obviously has symptoms, we would, we would, we would get it right away. Um, but um, that's the, the imaging part. Um, there's a clinical component. If a patient has new symptoms, we image, we image sooner. And more and more we see these, what we call the, um, the circulating tumor DNA tests that are not looking at describing the kind of mutation, but they're measuring the amount of, of tumor DNA in the blood. And ideally with treatment, we like to see a complete disappearance of, of tumor DNA. And, but the trajectory, um, whether it's increasing, decreasing, or staying the same, um, has uh, been more and more utilized as a way of non-invasively monitoring um, our, our disease space here. So I think that's a, um, um, a mix of clinical assessment, radiographic imaging assessment, and in the future, I think more and more blood-based uh, assessments as well. Okay. And, and what symptoms or side effects should prompt a patient to contact um, his or her oncologist? You know, um, cancer can do so many things that the answer here would be would be would be very limited. Um, my my instructions for my patients is whatever worries you, I need to know about. Um, I, I I don't want you to to self medicate. I don't want you to uh, sort of Google your symptoms. Um, if you have a um, if you have a problem, we need to address it. It's a um, um, Cancer can come in so many different um, in so many different ways. It's like a chameleon in its presentations. Um, I've had uh, I've had a patient once that had a, a metastasis in um, in the big toe and has been treated um, outside by for gout uh, until we actually started investigating and imaging. And it's not a common presentation at all. But um, cancer cancer does uncommon things. Yeah. Okay. Um... So uh, question about genetic counseling and testing, uh, when is it appropriate? And I guess I'll ask also, um, is a genetic counselor usually part of your care team? So there are two kinds of genetic mutations. There are those that are passed down in the bloodline or hereditary mutations for which the genetic counselors are, um, are ideally suited to, uh, to, uh, to be involved in the care. And then we have what we call these acquired or somatic mutations um, where we usually don't use the assistance of a of a genetic counselor um, for our um, for our, our our purposes. Now, what we find, I think, that's very important, and I have this a lot now that we are we're casting these wide nets. We see a patient that has a lung cancer, we're, we're sequencing the tumor, we see an EGFR mutation, and we're treating it. Then the report shows me um, in the background a, 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 a breast cancer associated BRCA mutation, for example. Um, and it's something that you can't ignore. Um, it, it is a um, probably an unrelated genetic change. Not every uh, not every change is a driver. Some are bystanders or, or passengers. Um, but those passengers can be very impactful for a um, um, patient that is uh, becomes a survivor or for the uh, the patient's family. So we've had um, data that about between ten and twenty percent of patients that have that had comprehensive molecular profiling for lung cancer have a cancer predisposing mutation in the background. So very, very important. So we actually, not by intent, but by by accident, uh, come back to our genetic counselors and actually take full advantage of it. It's very, very important. Um, you really have, um, and sometimes uh, in the heat of the moment, you worry about the lung cancer and you worry about what to do with it. Um, you don't recognize that there were three or four family members that had breast or ovarian cancer. And then you get the explanation uh, delivered to you in a in a somatic tumor test. Remember, um, a somatic tumor test is a is a cell that originates from the same pool of cells like any other cell in the body. So there is genetic overlap, and I always get a confirmation in the blood, um, just to be certain that this is not a secondary genetic alteration that may have occurred in the process of cancer development. But the um, uh, the, the the signal has to be acted on, and we've had a lot of patients. Um, that have had secondary mutations where we were able to um, to really um, uh, prevent cancers in family members by uh, by making that information available. Once you detect them, many of these companies actually allow for free genetic testing for family members. So it's a very um, it's a very good uh, good momentum. And I think uh, oftentimes when there's a new diagnosis of cancer, at least in my experience, oftentimes families come closer together. They talk. They exchange information. And then we're able to uh, to make uh, to take advantage of, of the information that we are that we're already um, procuring uh, for a patient. Okay. Um, 
how do you recommend for your patients that they best prepare themselves both physically, mentally, emotionally for upcoming treatment? You know, um, I do have to say my, my experience is that um, the more normal of a life you can live um, in uh, the, the closer um, um, to a normal life that, that you um, that, that you can engage in, the better the tolerance is that, in, that includes a lot of self-care, things that we may not be as good at. Um, but the, a lot of the cancer-related side effects, fatigue, low energy, um, um, uh, mood, depression, and our health by, by activity, health by, by social interactions, friends and family, and the worst thing that I, and I tell this to my, my patients, the worst thing you can do is to be withdrawn and overthinking and uh, um, basically on the couch with your laptop looking for, um, looking for, for symptoms. Um, um, I think that there is a, um, obviously an, an effect on, 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 uh, on, on the mind and, and, and the body by being, uh, being active. I have a lot of patients that are still working on immunotherapy or target therapies. They go to work and, um, you know, some of us not always love work every day. Um, the um, I think there is a um, um, positive effect to have a rhythm, to have uh, the exchanges, and not be not not be not be alone. Having good community, good fellowship of uh, of, of, of friends and family. Uh, one of the biggest uh, points of contention, and we get this a lot, unfortunately, now is nutrition. Um, and um, we recommend healthy, uh, balanced diet, wholesome nutritious uh, uh, food. Um, that is uh, sort of fueling the body. There are many myths around it. Um, um, Otto Warburg in the 1930s uh, um, demonstrated that cancer cells preferentially uh, consume sugar. And um, yeah, we've seen in PET scans, which is basically an infusion of a radioactive sugar solution that sugar en enriches in tumors. That's how we detect them. And um, the converse uh, conclusion that the... Um, uh, increase in sugar would um, would lead to an accelerated cancer growth, however, uh, is not the case. And we've seen this in, in, in patients with diabetes where the blood sugar at baseline is quite a bit higher. Um, so it's very important um, to not be um, overly um, concerned about, um, about, obviously, I don't want you to uh, to eat unhealthy food that I wouldn't recommend to any other patient. I mean, that's a, uh, uh, that's a, a clear, uh, uh, clear advice, but um. I, it's very important that patients meet their caloric needs. And oftentimes as the cancer consumes extra energy and um, that we're staying um, sort of in a, in a, in a healthy, uh, in a healthy scale. And um, we do recommend nutritional consults. I think that's very important. Um, but on a, from a pragmatic standpoint, when you're getting treatment, taste and appetite may already be hindered and uh, may already be affected by the side effects of our, of our therapies. And um, it is very difficult to restrict a patient to um, one kind of um, one kind of particular food, and um, also have to be aware that there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, unsigned, substantiated information out there that unfortunately uh, unfortunately doesn't help. I'm, I'm, for me, most importantly is um, do the patient stay hydrated and does 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 the weight uh, stay stable. I think that's those are very important sort of attainable measurements that we can do. And I don't think there's one food. Um, uh, that necessarily um, affects um, a, in a, a cancer in a positive way. It's not sometimes I see this on social media when patients bring me these information pieces that, that there are supplements sold for a lot of money. I think they're lacking uh, largely a scientific underpinning to actually to actually suggest them. I'm 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 not opposed to alternative medicine. I'm not opposed to um, uh, to looking at all of these things. But in in the end, um, like everything else that we do, it has to stand the test of, of, of scientific evidence. And if it's sort of an anecdotal um, um, sort of one-off description um, that, a, that a patient had a cure by, by eating high doses of lavender extract, that's unfortunately uh, quite common and obviously um, uh, oftentimes uh, uh, preying on, on, on patients in very vulnerable situations. Mm, yes. Uh, nutrition is very tricky. We will be having a webinar, I believe it's next week, uh, with the nutritionist to talk about uh, nutrition during oncology, when you have cancer and during treatment. A um, couple more questions before we wrap up. One is about clinical trials. Um, how? I guess the question would be why uh, participate in a clinical trial and how does one find one for non-small cell lung cancer? So um, uh, one one thing is in the a clinical trial is an experiment. 
Uh, and that's a concern that patients have. Well, how do I know that I don't get a sugar pill or a placebo? Um, I want to reassure you that uh, the physicians that are engaging in clinical trials and the sponsors, the scientists, they, they will put anything in their power um, in preparing a clinical trial to be successful. Nobody wants to have a clinical trial that is not aiming at an, at an improvement in standard of care. Um, that's very, very important. There's so much diligence in the selection of clinical trials that the um, um, the, the, the sort of the, the steps leading to the initiation of a clinical trial provide a lot of a lot of confidence and a lot of a lot of hope. And I think that's very important. So we're really not trying to uh, to, to sort of get a study observation, but we really want to have a study observation with an improved with an improved outcome. And that's that's one. I think it is um, uh, it is very recommended. Um, to consider clinical trials. Um, I think every patient should have a screen for a clinical trial and a screen for a clinical trial, not as a last resort effort in fourth line, but very early on. Um, I think it's very important. I always encourage um, uh, opinions and, and reviews, and especially now, um, and you've seen the, you've seen the data at, uh, at Rod Lung, the, um, that these new, these new therapies come to market using um, therapies when, um, when the, um, the body is the strongest, when the body is not yet um, worn down by cancer and treatment, and uh, is 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 most uh, most effective in my opinion. So I would do this very early on. Um, the the way to look at clinical trials there is a website tr clinicaltrials.gov. I think that's a um, sort of a, a starting point if you're if you're looking at this. But in the end, you need sort of a tour guide uh, through these websites. And uh, I think the, the the best places for these are either um, uh, large academic centers or uh, centers that have um, uh, uh, been uh, trying to bring uh, clinical trials into the into the community and uh, and making them available um, uh, for you um, uh, closer to home. I think those are um, those are very important uh, very important uh, important features. Which trial fits your kind of cancer? That's something that um, is typically the result of of studying lung cancer for a decade plus and to really have all the nuances. So um, I get a lot of questions uh, from patients that said, "Well, I saw this drug in the New York Times. That's the new cure of of cancer." But then you realize it's not um, the, the right kind of subtype of cancer to actually um, um, to actually fit your, uh, your 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 cancer type. So you need you need a physician um, that is heavily involved in clinical investigation and clinical research to make this happen. Have the confidence um, that every every effort has been taken to make a clinical trial a success when it comes to when it comes to fruition. Yeah, regulatory oversight that are very, very strict. Um, it's a lot of a lot of paperwork to ensure that those are ethical studies, the studies that are um, enhancing what we know, enhancing the knowledge base. And um, again, nobody wants to have a clinical trial and that uh, eventually results in no improvement or even a worse outcome. Uh, certainly um, don't see that much anymore. I think we're really trying to uh, uh, have better models and artificial intelligence and preclinical models really have helped us to design trials and drugs um, that have a much higher probability of, of success than we used to. All right. Well, thank you. That was uh, very uh, helpful, but also very encouraging. And uh, we appreciate it. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Dietrich. I think we do have to wrap up. Uh, I do want to mention that there are still a couple of questions that came in from our viewers and uh, we uh, we at Outcomes for Me will have a nurse practitioner get in touch and uh, answer your, your question, point you in the right direction. We got through a lot today, uh, weaving uh, several stories, I think, uh, uh, through the talk. Um, I hope the guidance that you provided uh, helps patients uh, engage in more informed decisions with their care team and ensure that they're receiving optimal personalized treatment based on their specific lung cancer profile. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions or thoughts, please email us at questions at outcomes for me, the number four, dot com, or enter it into the Ask Now box in the Outcomes for Me app, and we'll be in touch. We're gonna make this a recording of the video available uh, in our app if you wanna revisit it or share it with others. To make sure you don't miss any future updates, including the uh, uh, upcoming nutritional uh, webinar, uh, download the Outcomes for Me app if you haven't done that already and enable push notifications. Thank you so much again, Dr. Dietrich. Thank you for- Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it was great. And uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you so much. Appreciate you.